Hey everybody, hope you are doing well. I'm gonna give you a tour here of our sea container brooder facility. Um, we are just wrapping up our first season using this and it has worked really well. So I feel good enough about making a video and sharing the specifications about it with you. Um, so what this is, just your standard 40 foot sea container. And we bought it with the trailer. Got a pretty good deal on it from a guy who's got some connections. And we have converted it into our brooding facility. Now we want utility and multi-purpose uh, built into everything that we do. So uh, we, you know, we tried to do that with the container that if we need to, we can take uh, this wall out and do something different with it uh, down the road. And so uh, I will show you how we did that and go over some of the spe specifications of how we brood chicks. So you see we have a, uh, a high-tech ascension uh, device there to get into the brooder. And here's a quick view through the door, and we'll go inside in just a minute, but I wanted to show you the technical stuff out here. Um, we have a 100 amp service that we dropped in um, here, running down from our store. So we do have a panel here, and these are the thermostats that control our two uh, infrared heaters inside, as well as the right-hand one controls the fan um, override. So if it gets too hot, the fan will kick on and ventilate and cool it down. And I will post uh, links to all the stuff that we have used in this brooder here. This little device here, that is a timer for the fan. So you can set um, how many minutes your cycle will be and then using the dial, how long your cycle will be. We'll go over that more inside. And then here's our just standard uh, LED light switch that we can dim the lights at evening to replicate daylight. All right, so this is an airtight brooder. Um, three things that we found that are real necessary to, for a good brood. The first thing is drafts. And so when this, this thing is shut and the fans are off, um, there's not much airflow going in. So when the fan kicks on, these vents that we have up the side of the wall here and across the top, those will open up, allowing air to circulate through the top part of the brooder. So now let's step inside here. And I'll turn the lights up while we're looking at the brooder. Okay. See the vents here while this fan's running are opened up. And um, air is circulating through the top part of the brooder because you want to keep the air circulation by the bedding low. And we'll wait here till this fan turns off before I get into any of the other details. Um, with timing on the fan, we've been playing around with different uh, minutes and different uh, percentages of minutes. And um, don't quite have that entirely worked out yet, but it's been all right. All right, uh, so the container is 40 feet uh, long and eight feet across, roughly. And we've been successfully brooding seven to 800 chicks at a time in here. That uh, seemed to work out pretty well on space. So, uh, you know, every three weeks we can move 800 birds through here, so we can get quite a few through in a year. Um, for heat source, we are using electric infrared heaters uh, and they are working fantastically. I cannot say enough good things about them. Um, I am skittish about propane. Uh, I've seen too many pictures of stuff burning down when the propane heaters torch off. And the other thing too is that's an additional uh, utility that you have to have dropped into your brooder, bring that propane in. So these are 220 electric infrared heaters and they've worked great for drinkers. These are kind of your standard nipple drinker lines, and we have two of those in here. And then for feeders, you know, these are just your standard galvanized tumbler feeders. And for the first couple days that chicks are in here, we are putting cardboard down with uh, feed and grit on it as well. So we'll walk down here to where the birds are camping out and go over the, uh, the couple things I have about brooding to share with you guys. Gotta walk carefully. All right. 
things to pay attention to with brooding your chicks, um, to me, number one is giraffes. Draft can, giraffes can kill chicks quick because um, they will pile up trying to get away from it or it can cause a temperature fluctuation um, and that, that just raises your mortality numbers. Um, you know, keep in mind that the industry standard for you know, conventional poultry house, 2% um, loss on a flock you know, is considered okay, not that great, but that's kind of their, their standard. And a lot of uh, pastured poultry people all this fan is going. We'll just turn that off while we're talking. All right, a lot of pastured poultry operations are running much higher mortality rate. And when I say much higher, you know, I've talked to some big operations around the country, they're running 30, 40% mortality with their, with their poultry. So that to me is unacceptably high uh, and something, yeah, I think we have to work work at as a uh, alternative in industry, so to speak, with pasture poultry to get these mortality numbers to a, a more acceptable level. Level. Uh, if you see some of these big chicks in here, those are not some kind of GMO freak. <laughs> um, the last set that went out, there were maybe a dozen runty ones that we just left in the brooder and we found um, it just works better. Set them back with the next set and they'll go out to pasture with these guys and get butchered at the same time. You know, you could put them out with the other uh, 700, but, you know, they get out of the pens easier and they have a tendency to, to croak because it's a little bit too much for them on the pasture. So that's what we do is those little runty ones, we'll just leave them in the brooder and run them out with the next set. All right, so back to my points about uh, what you need to look for in your brooder. Drafts is a big one. Um, like I said on the front here, that thing is sealed up tight. So unless this fan is running, there is no drafts going on in here at all. Um, another big problem in kind of small producer brooding is predator issues. And that's probably the number one frustrating thing is when rats get in these brooders or snakes or weasels or raccoons, skunks, you know, the, the gamut of predators, they can shred your birds in the matter of just a few nights. So that was something else that we considered um, when we decided to go with a sea container and obviously um, steel walls there are no rats getting in this puppy so the, not a, not an issue here but i know that is a big issue that's been an issue with us in the past with other brooding arrangements and i'm really uh <laughs> i'm really grateful i don't have to worry about the rats this year um <coughs> All right, another issue with brooding that you see a lot is uh, piling in the corners, which kind of ties in with drafts. Um, if you have your drafts down and your temperature's right, piling shouldn't be an issue. And kind of what you see here, um, these are three-day-old chicks, and you can see how they are spread out um, across the brooder. Some are eating, some are you know drinking, the rest are just kind of lounging around. That's a, that's a good look for quiet time. I would say. Um, you know, there'll be other times they're all just running all over the place and, and having a good time. That's fine as well, but what you're trying to avoid is this clumping up of birds. That's indicative of your brooder being too cold. So those are some of the big issues. Uh, drafts, predator issues, um, inconsistent heat throughout the brooder can, uh, can cause problems. And, you know, something to keep in mind, <coughs> I think we can get too righteous on um, you know, trying to be the most pure pastured producer. You know, our, our chicks are on pasture from day three on. And hey, if that's working for you, that's great. But you know, to me, let's, let's keep the big picture in mind that we are trying to produce a quality product that is raised in a humane way, that's slaughtered humanely and uh, at a small scale with cleanliness being important. Um, you know, a bird that's had good food and grass and bugs in its diet and is a delicious product that we can provide for our customers at an economical price in a way that we can stay in business. And if we're running 50% mortality by brooding chicks on pasture just for the, um, you know, <laughs> emotional satisfaction of purity, I would question... 
um, your sustainability to start with. So you know that's something that people will debate on, I'm sure. But you know these birds are going to be in this brooder for three weeks, and that's when they go out to pasture. <coughs> And it doesn't matter if it's April or August. That is the way we do it because that's the protocol um, that we have developed and we don't make any bones about it. So we, you know, we're trying to achieve under 10% mortality on our groups in its entirety. So if we put 80 or 800 birds in here, we want to be butchering at least 720. And even that is considered so-so. Um, you know, we're trying to get these mortalities down really low. Um, so, you know, if, again, not judging if you're brooding on pasture, getting great finish weights, uh, low mortality, then great. That's great. <clears throat> but that is not the case for us. All right. I'm trying to think of uh, anything else I can point out about our, our brooder setup here. Um, I guess the other thing would be bedding. Uh, I know some people do deep bedding and, uh, that's something they're very proud of. <coughs> Get some dust in my lungs here. Um, we don't do deep bedding in here. We've done it in the past. Um, in here, we are not doing it. We're cleaning out the bedding each time. So you can see there's only about an inch of bedding on this floor. And really, I can't say I've noticed a difference in mortality um, from you know changing bedding every time to letting it accumulate up. And really, the reason that we decide to clean it out every time is real simple um, in that we can push two inches of bedding all the way down to the door and shovel it out with snow shovels, but you ain't doing that with two feet of bedding. Um, plus, you know, that, that heat would um, cause a lot more, you know, heat to be in the brooder. And, you know, right now it's late July. Um, our challenge is keeping this thing cool during the heat of the day and not so much worried about keeping it warm. You know, our heaters are on now, but it's 930 at night and it's cooling off outside. So I think I about covered everything that I could think of. If you got any other questions, definitely comment and uh, I'd be happy to answer what I can. Um, I guess one other thing would be our feed. We use the same feed all the way through from day one till slaughter. And I'll post a link up on that, where we get it from, what their recipes are and all that fun stuff. Um, we do also feed some peanuts as well uh, once they're out on pasture. And we've had some good success with that. But for now, that's it. Uh, this is our brooder, and uh, you know, with our first year wrapping up here, uh, we're running well under 5% mortality in the brooder, which um, I, I think is really great. Some sets have gone out at 0% mortality. Uh, one set went out with more than we ordered, so I guess they must have sent some extras. Uh, and then we did have one set that had some higher mortality, probably up close to 10%. And you know, I don't like to point fingers, but the only variable on that set was the hatchery. So I'm wondering if there were some different genetics that they hatched out um, or something when they came down here, but we could tell as soon as those chicks unloaded that they had issues. They were lethargic, not running around, kind of just clumping up and, and there was something wrong. And we ended up losing about 10% on that set. But not to complain, 5% on the year uh, is great as we are developing this concept and looking forward to wrapping up our season. So that's it. Reporting here from the brooder. This is Jordan with Farm Builder. Thanks so much for watching and feel free to comment and have a great day.